A very warm welcome to The Bottom Line, a look at the business news of the day. I'm Francis Hurd. Now, central bank governors are usually known for their savvy around numbers and not for their fighting spirit. But Reserve Bank Governor Lesetje Chanyacho recently said he would go to war to protect the independence of the bank. The mandate and the ownership of the Reserve Bank have been in the spotlight throughout this year, and the bank seems to be the subject of a battle within and without the ANC. In in June, the party's Secretary General, Ace Machashule, announced that the party's NEC, Lakhotla, had resolved to expand the mandate of the bank. Now, that was immediately contradicted by the ANC Head of Economic Transformation, Inoch Gorongwana. We spoke to him at the time, as well as the Finance Minister, Tito Mboweni, who said uh, that Machashule misrepresented that meeting. When it comes to ownership, there are still some private shareholders in the bank. They have no say over the bank's policy, but some are concerned the ANC resolved to nationalize the bank at its conference in 2017. Now, before we speak to the Reserve Bank Governor, here's a very quick overview uh, of the shareholding, how it works. So there are around 700 shareholders, foreign and local, owning 2 million shares. They do not share in the profits, uh, which amounted to billions last year. Dividends, uh, the annual payout for shareholders, capped at 10 cents per share. So the bank uh, pays a maximum of 200,000 rand a year. That is it. Because shareholding is also regulated, the largest shareholder can only earn 2,000 rand. Well, Kasatu, the EFF and some leaders in the ANC uh, would want the bank nationalized now, but Reserve Bank Governor Lesetje Chanyacho says this will actually play into the hands of some of those shareholders themselves. He joins us and now. Thank you for being with us, uh, Governor. Thank so, you. so this seems like a lot of controversy, about 2,000 rand, uh, which is what some of the shareholders are earning, the biggest shareholders. You've said there's a nationalist agenda actually being pushed by these shareholders, which, which sounds bizarre. Can, can we start there? Can you explain what you think is going on? Well, it's not a nationalist agenda. Uh, it is, and I thank you very much for explaining the things. And I think that in a way you have said everything that I, uh, I wanted to Thanks. say. <laughs> uh, the point here is that uh, this drive is not a South African agenda. It's a, an agenda driven by these shareholders because at dispute here is who owns the foreign exchange reserves uh, of the bank. And they would argue that they have got a share uh, of these reserves. Uh, but by law, they cannot quite get access to uh, these reserves. And the only way they could actually really access these reserves is to force a contestation about the ownership so that what would then happen mm. is that we might end up in some international court about the valuation of the bank. And when you get there, we don't know which way it could go. It could vary from anything from 20 million rands to maybe 100 billion rands. Uh, that is the money that the country does not have. But even if the country had that money, is that money we would like to spend to buy out shareholders or is that money we would rather spend on a hospital or a school or a road or a bridge or something like mm. that and, and they can only make this claim on the foreign reserves of, of the country which like you say we're talking about billions instead of these little payments uh, every year when the bank is nationalized if and when so, so it's not something hanging over the bank otherwise? It's not a given thing. Uh, it's something that would be contested probably in the courts here and in uh, overseas courts because uh, we uh, had signed bilateral investment, uh, investment treaties. Uh, but quite frankly, this is a conversation that is a distraction from the real issues that this country should be yeah. talking about. So, so do you think those foreign shareholders, let, let's just clarify so, so no one can get this wrong, are actually pushing, maybe even behind the, the, the push for nationalization that we're seeing in South Africa? Are they working with the politicians? It's, well, they are pushing, um, and we saw it at our AGM. Some of the proxies that they sent at our AGM included a, a prominent local government politician who had, was a proxy of one of the foreign shareholders. Okay, very interesting. Beyond that, do you care about ownership? Uh, I think you've, you've pointed out that we see in the world there are reserve banks publicly owned that are independent, others publicly owned that are not independent. Does it actually matter if, if, if government, if, if the country uh, owns the reserve bank or if there are some private shareholders? What matters is 
the institutional settings in a country. Um, the Bundesbank, for example, in uh, Germany has always been government owned, but the predecessor of the current Bundesbank caused massive inflation in, uh, in Germany, but it was publicly owned. Mm. Today's Bundesbank is a fierce uh, advocate of price stability, and it is still government, uh, uh, government owned. For, 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 for us here, the issue about ownership is really a distraction. That's not a conversation really that we should be having. The conversation that South Africans should be having is this conversation about the state of this economy and how we get more people included mm -hmm. in ordinary economic activity. You have said you're confer concerned that the, the talk about um, nationalization has become conflated with talk about the mandate of the bank. Is, is that where you come in saying, uh, I will go to war for, for the independence of the bank? Well, all South Africans... And how are those getting conflated? They are, co they are conflated uh, 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 because when you listen to people who motivate uh, uh, this thing, they started talking about uh, the mandate of the bank. If you, in spite of the fact that some prominent political leaders said that, no, the, the, the independence and the mandate of the central bank are sacrosanct. The narrative out there is still that, well, these things are, uh, uh, these things are, are, are related. From where we are, uh, we are, we are standing, uh, as we had always consistently said, what is important is the mandate of the bank, is the independence uh, uh, of the bank, and it should not just be those of us who are in the central bank, we should rise and defend the institution should it come under, uh, under attack. Actually, I think correctly, South Africans should actually rise and say, not in the name of our institution. Mm. How, how attacked do you feel right now? Because you've actually used the words, uh, unless somebody is lying, that there are barbarians at the gate of the South African Reserve Bank. Well, uh, I guess... Uh, uh, the people have got to understand figures of figures of speech, yeah. and the figures of speech are, uh, are actually very important. And I think that uh, the, the, the correct analogy that uh, I had used is that this debate about nationalization of the bank is more like a Trojan horse uh, that uh, once uh, inside, warriors come out and they do all sorts of things. And we have yeah. seen it in, uh, in our case that the discussion had always been about ownership and suddenly out of nowhere people started talking about the money people started talking about our role in licensing of banks and all sorts of uh, all sorts of things these things get conflated and quite frankly given the economic challenges that we face now as a country the conversation we should be having is how do we grow this economy so that this economy can actually create jobs and get more people included in economic activity? Yeah. Well, well, there's no doubt that the bank is at the center of, of a political fight. Uh, some would say that's maybe the conservatives versus the, the populace. Um, you're being targeted sometimes. Have you, have you had enough? Because I see this week you've sued Andile and Lungisa, uh, the councillor, Nelson Mandela Bay. Um, he called you the K-word. He called you a dutiful servant of our racist classes. Uh, those arguments will be ventilated in court. I've got no further comment on it. Have you had enough, though? Are, are you feeling um, the, the pressure of, of the bank being I'm at the of the I'm using the politics? court processes to defend the institution that South Africans have tasked me to serve. Fair enough. You must know that this debate um, could even heat up. Uh, your job, uh, the fight for the independence of the bank, may get harder. Did you think about that when, when you took the second term? Was there any reluctance there? No, I did think about it, and I actually felt duty-bound. I owed it to the 2,000 honest South Africans who are every day waking up, getting to the South African Reserve Bank to execute the mandate of the bank as tasked by the people of this country. I owed it to them to continue to lead them and make sure that this institution of our democracy that is revered around the world is actually protected, uh, continues to serve the South Africans independently and without fear or favor. Is it even more important in a situation when an institution maybe like the Reserve Bank is under? We have seen our institution of our democracy gutted. And um, 
uh, the South African Reserve Bank, when uh, it came under attack, we saw it as part of that systematic attack on institutions of our uh, democracy. We felt duty bound to um, uh, to uh, fight for this independence. And you asked the question when whether this thing crossed uh, my mind when I took the thing, and I said yes, of course, so it crossed it crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. And some people have even asked me. Uh, why didn't you just maybe consider even resigning? Says that resigning is not an option. The constitution says that the people who are appointed into this position must act without fear or favor. So resigning would have meant that I am actually giving up. I'm actually cowing when South Africans actually need me most. Mm. Are you willing to uh, venture? Uh, uh, speak out about the motives what do you think is going on uh, with with these politicians uh, attacking the reserve bank uh, we, don't, we, we don't we don't make political comments at the south african reserve bank okay um governor when it comes to the mandate of the bank there, there's also a lot of confusion and and i think it's confusing to lay people who don't understand the economics it can become a political tool are there words being used like neoliberal as as if an economic policy in in itself is is evil um Ultimately, the, the narrative suggests that the bank is maybe protecting rich people, maybe protecting the status quo, not fighting for the poor. I'm sure that you believe the current mandate of the bank actually protects the poor. C can you just tell me how it works and, and how you believe it's the best for South Africa right now? Well, attaching labels is not a very useful way of engaging in conversations. And most of the time when people throw labels, I know they do not have a substantive argument uh, to make. So let's throw the labels aside and focus on what the Constitution says. The Constitution says we must protect the value of the currency in the interest of balanced and sustainable growth. What does that actually mean? You see, the authors of our Constitution were students of history. They understood that for you to get balance and sustainable growth, you actually need price stability. Price stability is a necessary condition for balance and sustainable growth. But it is by no way a sufficient condition. It's necessary, but not sufficient. You need all the other aspects of policy to come into play uh, uh, with terms of the structure of the economy and the transformation of the economy to get balanced and sustainable growth. So let's put these things for what it means for the ordinary person. The money that you have in your pocket is but just a piece of paper or a piece of metal. When inflation jumps through your house, public confidence jumps out through the window and that piece of paper and that piece of metal is worthless. Mm. Our task is to protect the money in your pocket, to ensure that the money that you have in your pocket is buying roughly the same basket of goods and services today as it would buy in the future. And economists then would say, what rate of price increases would you tolerate in order to protect the value of the money in your pocket? Mm. So if you, you and I are both on fixed salaries, uh, I, I presume you are if you are at the SABC. <laughs> uh, we're both on fixed salaries. Now and then we might negotiate once a year to get a salary increase. It's unlikely that we will get two salary increases in a, a, in a year. If the price of goods and services, namely inflation, is higher than your salary increase, you are worse off than you were mm. in the previous You're getting year. poorer. You are getting poorer. If you are a recipient of a social grant, you can't even negotiate what the rate of increase of the social grant is. Government decides this is the rate of increase of the social grant. And if goods, prices of goods and services rise faster than your social grant, your social grant is becoming less and less every year. Mm. And so, those who are rich own financial assets, they own shares on the stock exchange, they own government bonds, they own properties. 
all of those financial assets have got features that protect the rich against the ravages of inflation. Those who are ordinary working people who are living on fixed salaries or who are dependent on the state who live on social grants do not own those assets and cannot protect themselves against the ravages of inflation. And that is why the authors of our constitution tasked one institution with a responsibility for price stability, and that institution is the South African Reserve Bank. So, so you always have an eye on inflation. When, when the ANC, when the Secretary General says the bank should be targeting jobs and growth, uh, it, it sounds very good. It suggests lower rates uh, because suddenly people can borrow, can spend, the, the economy gets a boost. Are you as the bank, and, and I'll try to put it simply, keeping interest rates as low as possible given the risk of inflation? So, so you're balancing those, those two things. Well, we do not respond to political uh, parties. We are an institution of state. Sure, but this is what people are hearing. People, yeah, so I will respond. Good will for jobs, good for growth. So, so are you trying to do that, but looking at the risks okay. as well? Ask somebody who is unemployed and say, to the person who is unemployed that you need to have access to borrowing. In terms of our own legislation, that's reckless. Yeah. It's like trying to shove debt down in the throats of people who cannot afford it. If this country needs interest rates lower than what we are having now, we must have a lower inflation. Mm. If we have higher inflation, we can only have higher interest rates. People, if we cast our minds back and say, in the 80s, what was the inflation rate in this country and what were the interest rates? Inflation was averaging 15, 16% and interest rates were like at 19%. Mm. Uh, in 1998, uh, interest rates jumped as high as 25.5% because inflation had gone up. And in the current era, over the period from 2000 after the introduction of inflation targeting, where we governments together with the Reserve Bank set a target and said the target for inflation will be three to six, we had managed to contain inflation. And because we were able to contain inflation, South Africa experienced lower interest rates. In July, we were able to adjust the policy rate, the repo rate lower not because we're feeling pressure or anything of that sort, not because of what had happened to inflation in the past, but because, in our view, the outlook for inflation going forward was that inflation is going to remain contained and will be within our target, and so you get it. Lower inflation leads to lower uh, interest rates. If you are going to tolerate higher inflation, understand that you are going to have to tolerate higher interest rates. Thank you. And we're running out of time. You, you've always said that monetary policy can only do so much anyway, um, that there are structural issues in, in the economy that, that you cannot tweak uh, just by changing interest rates. What are those structural issues and who can deal with them? Well, those structural issues are in the realm of uh, government and many of them are spelled out in the National Development uh, Plan and I do not need uh, to repeat uh, those things. That national development plan was a commitment this government made to the people of this country. It was adopted across political parties in, uh, in parliament and government must implement those structural reforms as government has committed mm. to. You were asked last week if South Africa would have to go uh, cap in hand to the IMF. Uh, there, there's a lot of talk about that possibility. May I ask you to repeat what you said? Um, for the benefit of your viewers, I, mean, I, I will do it. South Africa does not have to go to the IMF cap in hand. The future of this country is in our hands. You end up in the IMF because you have lost confidence of lenders. You have messed up your economic policy so badly that the only choices you have can only be bad ones. And when you are faced with that, no one wants to lend you money, and the only institution that will be prepared to lend you money will be the IMF. And when the IMF eventually decides to lend you money, guess what they are going to do? They are going to ask you to do 
all those things that we know we must do now that we are not doing, except that in this case, we will be doing them with someone policing us and monitoring that we are implementing. And if you do not implement, I do not give you the money. You implement, I give you the money. And that is what you end up, uh, you end up with. This country has got a history of conquering adversity. We had been able in the period from around 1996 when people thought that we might actually end up uh, at the IMF that we decided to take tough decisions as a country, stabilized our economy, embarked on a reform program, and guess what? We were able from that period up until the global financial crisis to lift the growth rate of uh, this economy. These things are within our hands. We must make the difficult, difficult trade-offs with society and stop promising society things that we cannot afford, that we cannot achieve. And understand that when making public policy, there are trade-offs. And those trade-offs include the choices we make today, which might be painful, but are in the interest of our long-term future. We cannot allow the excesses of today's generation to put a burden on our children and our children's children. And because we cannot afford some of the things we want done today, we end up piling the country with debt and leaving our children and our grandchildren with debt instead of creating assets for them. Okay. Uh, Reserve Bank Governor, thank you so much for coming in. And, and let's end with the hope uh, there that the worst can be avoided. Thank you very much for your time, Alessia Chanyaho. Reserve Bank Governor, and that was the bottom line. Uh, by the way, an IMF representative today saying uh, very much the same thing, uh, that South Africa's debt is becoming worrisome, uh, but right now South Africa has no need uh, to actually approach the IMF or think about that yet. All right, uh, that's a wrap from me. Good night.